I just wanted to say hi to everybody and thank you for joining today. Um, as Kelsey mentioned, my name is Maxin and my pronouns are she, her. I'm a senior research and policy associate with PolicyWise for Children and Families. Um, it's been my pleasure to work on this project with my colleague, Nicole, as well as our partners at the National Collaborating Center on Environmental Health, um, specifically Angela Echelbosch on this project entitled Public Health Practices to Support Community Psychosocial and Mental Health Response and Recovery Post-Flooding. I'd like to start by acknowledging that I work, live, and learn on Treaty 6 territory and the homelands of Métis Nation of Alberta Region 4. I make this land acknowledgement to reaffirm my commitment to reconciliation. On the slides, you'll see a photo I took of the Dwatnau Bridge that crosses the North Saskatchewan River, which runs through what is now called the city of Edmonton. I recently learned that Dwatnau means valley in Cree. I love visiting and exploring the river valley, and while there are a lot of bridges along it, I, found, I find this new bridge to be particularly special as there's over 500 panels of First Nation and Métis art along the bridge that showcase past and present Indigenous culture. I know that everyone's joining today from different places, so if you haven't already, um, as Kelsey prompted you to, I'd really encourage you to write in the chat to acknowledge the traditional land that you're situated on and share any reflections or actions um, to take to move that you like to take to move towards reconciliation. And in thinking about my relationship to the land, my ongoing commitments um, to acts of reconciliation and the context of this project, I wanted to talk about how climate change and climate related disasters like flooding have unique and disproportionate impacts on Indigenous peoples and their traditional lands. In Canada, First Nations have experienced climate related flooding and also faced forced displacement due to planned flooding meant to divert water from nearby towns and cities. Yeah, I can hear it now. These actions show the ongoing injustice and colonization of Indigenous communities and their lands. And the psychosocial impacts of flooding on Indigenous communities are severe and profound due to their removal from and loss of traditional lands. So I just wanted to indicate that there's still much work to be done in this area. Flooding is one of the most common climate-related disasters and floods are increasing in frequency across Canada. In addition to the diverse impacts on environment, health and safety, infrastructure, and economy, there's also significant psychosocial and mental health impacts, which are disproportionately felt by systemically excluded groups. We began this work last year in 2022, after the 2021 flooding in the BC Lower Mainland, as our partners at the NCCH saw a need to have more resources to share with public health professionals to help communities recover from psychosocial impacts of flooding. So the work I'm presenting on today fits into a larger conversation around climate change, climate justice, and climate adaptation. We had two objectives in this project. We aim to describe the mental health and psychosocial well being impacts of flooding on the people and communities affected in order to increase decision makers' understanding of this issue. We emphasize systemically excluded groups throughout the work. And by systemic exclusion, we mean the structures, policies, and practice that limit access to health opportunities and thriving for specific groups due to social circumstances and characteristics like location of residence, race, class, and gender. So to provide some examples of groups experiencing systemic exclusion, this would include Indigenous peoples, people living in rural and remote locations, people with a lower socioeconomic status, and children and young people. For objective two, we also aim to identify community level practices to mitigate the mental health and psychosocial impacts of flooding, and also describe the contextual factors that contribute to the effectiveness of the identified practices. Next 
We worked closely with our partners at the NCCEH, and we convened and engaged a pan-Canadian advisory group that included representatives from five provinces and territories. The advisors were professionals in government and nonprofit who work in disaster psychosocial response and recovery. And we'll have an opportunity to chat with some of them later during our panel discussion. So with input from the NCCH team the and the advisory group, we completed a targeted review of Canadian academic and practice-based sources, as well as conducted interviews with key informants. We then analyzed and synthesized what we read and heard to form the findings of our reports. So we published two reports, which are both available online on the NCCEH website in both English and French. And so to access the reports right now, you can use your smartphone camera to scan the QR codes on the screen um, or follow the links to each report. Um, I think some of these will be sharing those in the chat. So in the first report, we addressed the impacts of flooding on psychosocial well-being and identified Canadian priorities for psychosocial recovery. In our second report, we outlined seven practices for public health practitioners that they can adapt to support post-flooding psychosocial response and recovery. And I'd really encourage you to read these reports to get more information and details about what we discussed today, as well as access some relevant resources for practice. For the rest of my presentation, I'll share our findings from these reports about the psychosocial impacts of flooding, then share about the community level public health practices, and finish off with challenges and opportunities for supporting psychosocial well being. So regarding the impacts, we found that flooding has both short-term and long-term mental health impacts that can persist over years, as well as compound with other climate-related events or other disasters. The negative psychosocial and mental health outcomes include things like stress and grief, financial strain, family discord, and feelings of isolation, helplessness, and worry. Among children, it can sometimes cause behavioral and school performance challenges. And in some, but not all cases, mental health conditions like depression and post-traumatic stress disorder can develop or worsen after flooding. Many of these psychosocial impacts occur across disasters and crises, whereas some are more specific to flooding. So for one example, uh, many Canadians lack flood insurance, and this can contribute to financial strain and difficulties finding safe housing, which has negative impacts on mental health. We also found the impacts of flooding disproportionately affect systemically excluded groups, leading to worsening existing health inequities. So, for example, in rural and remote communities, we found that flooding can block bridges, roads, and ferries, resulting in residents being cut off from nearby, nearby towns, their workplaces sometimes, and mental health services and facilities that aren't directly in the community. Um, so I just want to share a quote here by a key informant who talked about the need for long-term planning and resourcing to support community recovery. They said, when we're talking about pretty large catastrophes affecting the community, we need to think about a five-year or 10-year plan. Before getting into some of the more specific public health practices, um, I wanted to start by noting that all practices are grounded in having strong relationships and trust. This is something that we read and heard about um, over the course of our work. When relationships are established, People involved in flood response can quickly mobilize and work together towards community recovery. Strong relationships can reduce reliance on external supports and facilitate, or facilitate a greater reach among community members, especially those who are maybe isolated or systemically ex excluded as well. 
So some actions here to support relationships include identifying and leveraging existing relationships, um, even when these are, are not tied directly to disaster response. And it can also be helpful to advocate for and allocate resources towards creating and maintaining relationships. Um, another quote here, um, a key informant who worked in public health at a provincial level shared how the relationships with the flood affected community start right away when a disaster happens and can go on for several years. They said, you're going to have to work with the community for a long time. So think about all your decisions, actions, and communication, not only for today, tomorrow, and next week, but as setting the basis for a long-term relationship. So as I mentioned, we identified seven practices, which all have several sub-practices that are grounded in relationships. Um, and you'll notice that I numbered the different practices on the slides. So this is simply to make it easier to follow along as I talk about each of them. Um, and I wanted to note that it's not meant to rank them in terms of importance or um, order them in any other way. I'll go over each practice and give some examples for each. And you'll quickly note how it's important to adapt the practices to the strengths, needs, resources, and specific circumstances of the affected community. But there's also many opportunities to learn from others. So I'd encourage you to share in the chat um, examples from your experience or any resources for, from your communities or your organizations that you found to be practical so that we can continue to learn from each other. And after this webinar, we'll be gathering all the resources and sharing them in a blog post. So the first practice is centering community leadership. And to provide an example here um, of convening community leaders, during the 2018 floods in Grand Forks, BC, community leaders from many sectors, including public health, mental health and substance abuse, school districts, human services, housing and law enforcement, quickly formed a wellness working group based on relationships that were already existing. This group worked together to identify and resolve issues as they learned about them. The second practice is strengthening community connection. One substrategy is to use gatherings as informal psychosocial resources to build friendships and sense of community. So um, organizing events such as dinners, traditional healing circles, cultural events, and arts-based activities can help to bring people together. And, and to reach people who might not usually um, be interested in attending a social gathering, one of our advisors suggested pairing opportunities for social connection with an event where disaster-related support was being offered, for example, financial or cleanup support. One of our key informants, actually several of our key informants, shared about taking a strength-based approach. And one of them said, we're really adopting an empowering and asset-based approach. So we don't try to see people as a bunch of problems and risk factors, but rather to see them as potential and strengths and resources and assets to the community. And so what we kept hearing is that this can contribute to building to community healing, well-being and capacity building. Another practice is to center reconciliation and Indigenous views of well being during a flood response. Indigenous nations have a right to make decisions affecting their territories. This includes decisions about flooding recovery and adaptation. So, listening to the knowledge and wisdom shared by elders and knowledge keepers is crucial, including their perspectives on strategies to heal from flooding and forced displacement. We read and heard as well about the importance of prioritizing responder well being. Community responders and frontline service providers are often supporting community recovery, 
while also navigating their own flood experiences that can include things like personal losses and trauma. So it can be helpful to train responders in recognizing the signs of stress, burnout, and secondary trauma. And we wanted to note that leaders also have a role in modeling, monitoring, and supporting well-being practices, ideally before negative mental health consequences develop. Public health practitioners will also work closely um, with other sectors and agencies to support community psychosocial recovery. Um, I've listed these on the slides, but they include primary care, housing, education, arts and recreation, infrastructure, and transportation, as well as charitable and faith-based organizations. And it can be helpful to apply an internal communication strategy to bring all these different groups together in a coordinated way. When working with folks in the community, um, having one point of contact can help people navigate what can be a complex support system and connect them with the services that they need. And this aligns with a trauma-informed care approach. One of our key informants shared that organizing activities grounded in arts and culture can support social connection and long-term well-being. They said, we found, we found out, what we found out is that we need to diversify the range of activities so that everybody can find a way to get connected with an initiative or an activity. The sixth practice we identified was communicating and, and engaging with community. It's important, it's important for leaders to inform and provide a sense of support for people who live in their communities. This has been done through hosting town halls, open houses, door-to-door -door visits, and virtual meetings. Uh, one example shared with us was the Canadian Red Cross hosted an online drop-in knowledge exchange for community members. And we might have an opportunity to learn more about that um, later during our, during our panel discussion. So understanding community needs, using diverse communication channels, and offering relevant translations is important to reach and engage all community members and taking into account different language and technological uh, barriers people might experience. And finally, um, gathering and sharing insights, stories, and lessons learned is our final practice. Both qualitative and quantitative data can help public health professionals understand community needs in real time and as well as in the long term. They can use what they learn to advocate for funding and resources and provide more responsive services. Using minimally invasive, community-based, and culturally responsive data collection methods can reduce the risk of creating more psychological harm while applying the findings directly to benefit the community. One such example is when working with First Nations and their data, it's important to apply OCAP principles to ensure that nations retain ownership, control, access, and possession of their data, information, and cultural knowledge. On the importance of knowledge sharing, one of our advisors said, we have lots to learn, not just from our region, but from all over the globe. And the hope is that with each time we provide this knowledge, that we share this experience, that it sticks, and that it creates that it creates a change or positive impact for people. Overall, psychosocial recovery after a flood can be long, nonlinear, and look very different in each community. Yet there are some challenges that are overarching across Canada that influence how practitioners can engage in community level practices. So we want to highlight a few of the real and meaningful challenges to the work of disaster psychosocial recovery. So you can be aware and plan for them as well as advocate for changes to address them.
we found that preparedness overlaps with the response and recovery phases, particularly when communities are facing concurrent or repeating events. It's important on one hand to prepare before a disaster to be able to respond quickly and appropriately. And on the other hand, once, once a disaster has occurred, helping to prepare for another event can help community members cope with traumatic experience, reduce their stress, and improve their sense of control. Fostering community-based relationships before, during, and after a disaster can enhance community leadership and resilience. There is value in investing in relationships before a flood happens. However, we've noticed we've noted that relationship building is often taken for granted and under-resourced. Um, on, on knowledge sharing, having enough capacity to collect and analyze data is another ongoing challenge. There are opportunities to learn from a community's own experiences of recovery from other types of disasters and crises, as well as across jurisdictions to develop disaster response and recovery plans. Knowledge sharing, knowledge gathering and sharing can help advocate for more resources, including funding, which is the last priority listed here on the slide. So not surprisingly, funding is tied to all the other priorities. Funding is typically available in the immediate aftermath of a disaster rather than supporting recovery and preparedness. But psychosocial recovery after a flood requires sustained long-term and adequate funding during all disaster phases to support the development of meaningful relationships and to facilitate knowledge sharing. Uh, one of our advisory committee members noted the interaction between funding cycles, disaster preparedness and response phases, and the relationship with communities. They said, it always seems with us, some disaster occurs, then funding is available, then you have to hire and develop the team, you have to retrain, and the cycle continues. We're at a point where a lot of our grant funding has ended, so my team has shrunk down again. And at some point they'll say, how come you're not ready for the next one? But if you have to reestablish connections within communities, you're starting all over again. Uh, to summarize, climate events such as floods are on the rise. Communities may experience concurrent and repeated events, which have a significant and inequitable impact on child, family, and community well-being. We found that strong relationships and trust facilitate preparedness and recovery from such events. We hope that by listening to this presentation, reading and sharing our reports, and engaging in the panel discussion that we'll have in a few minutes, you'll feel like you can reimagine, extend, or adapt the practices for your local circumstances, populations, and contexts. I'd like to thank you all for joining and listening today. And I'd also want to acknowledge everyone who made this work possible. We are grateful to specifically Angela and our partners at the NCCEH, the members of our advisory group and the key informants for sharing their experiences and insights. You can also see our contact information and the PolicyWise and NCCEH websites on the slides if you wanna learn more or connect with us in this way. Um, and now I'd like to welcome and thank our four panelists for joining us today. Um, having worked with them over the course of this project, I can say that they really are the true experts on this topic. They really bring a wealth of knowledge and experience, and I can say that we'll only scratch the surface today. Um, so to start, I will give each person a chance to introduce themselves and share how their role relates to disaster psychosocial recovery. And then in the meantime, please share your questions using the chat. And um, with Nicole's help, we'll try to, to ask as many ask as many. <laughs> so I will so I will. Mm -hmm. 
hear an echo. I hear an echo. All right, so let's, um, I'll start with uh, Graham and then go to Guy. And um, if you'd like to introduce yourselves. Hello, all. my name is Graham Matzella. I, I'm the, I'm just gonna have to mute myself and clear my throat here, sorry about that. Hi, uh, I'm the manager of mental health uh, and mental health promotion and illness prevention, which is part of the provincial addiction and mental health program and services team at Alberta Health Services. I've been with the team for around four and a half years and the manager of the team for two of those years. I'm located in Calgary, but our team is provincial in scope. We work with all five zones throughout the province and directly with communities. Uh, my role in disaster psychosocial recovery is uh, grant funded, um, and those grants have most recently ended for us. Um, we had worked on a wildfire recovery grant in Fort McMurray. We were interrupted by a COVID response, and also most recently worked on the Paddle Prairie wildfire uh, initiative. We do things like workshops, we provide virtual and physical resources. Uh, our work initially started in disaster psychosocial work in 2013 to the Southern Alberta flood. So it was nine years continuously until just this January, uh, at which time all of our grants have ended. So we're trying our best to try to fill in the gaps wherever we can with our work going forward. Awesome, thank you, Graham. Uh, Guy? Hello, I'm Guy Shake. I'm the director of the uh, Alberta Fire Recovery Operations out of Fort Bay here since 2016. And on April 27, 2020, mm. I received an evacuation order and I left my condo and I returned on October 5. So I have lived experience of being a flood affected person. And um, one of the um, results of the, the flood in uh, Fort McMurray, since we had pre-existing relationships with a lot of the partners there, we actually um, designated funding to support the psychosocial aspects of, of, the, um, of this uh, event. And uh, so I, I look forward to sharing a little bit more about the flood collaborative that um, came out of this. And thank you. Thanks, Guy. Um, I'll go to Margreta and then Darlene after. Sure, thanks. Uh, I'm Margareta Lund and I'm the lead for wellness planning and recovery, uh, working with the provincial psychosocial um, services team under Health Emergency Management BC, which is also um, under the Provincial Health Services Authority. And um, we're quite involved with um, psychosocial support um, in response to um, disasters. Um, definitely that we deploy um, psychosocial volunteers to help with psychological first aid. And um, then once the response is over, um, I work more with the communities as based on their, their needs and, and wants to help on the uh, mental health and wellness um, part of recovery. So depending on um, what type of support that they need, we're, we're there to um, we have a we have a guide that kind of um, gives them a, a template of how to move forward working with the community if they have not done that uh, much prior to which quite often um, is not the case in some cases uh, it was a very robust relationship with their social sectors in their community so uh, but we try to help out with that and make that connection between the the province and the uh, local uh, support groups and really trying to, you know, analyze and help them with what their needs are and sort of predictors about uh, what may happen in the longer term and about the increases in domestic violence and substance use and all those kind of things that they um, may or may or may not happen. So that's kind of my uh, long introduction. I, I've been uh, doing this for almost seven years and then prior to that was have been with emergency management for, I don't know, 20, 25 years. So that's all. Thank you. Thanks, Margareta. Thanks, Margareta. Oh, Darlene. Oh, Darlene. 
Hi everyone, my name is Darlene Oshansky. Um, I work at Manitoba Health. I'm an emergency preparedness coordinator there. I've been in that position for the last six years, but prior to that, I was working at a provincial office of disaster management, which was primarily involved in health emergency management. But at that time, that's where we felt that the provision of psychosocial services uh, lied in that venue. Um, so I had the privilege of being the provincial uh, psychosocial flood recovery team coordinator in 2012, which was in response to our 2011 flood, um, a one in 300 year flood, um, quite significant. Unfortunately, we only received the funding and were able to pull our teams together a year after the fact. So I think we'll probably get into some of that later. Um, unfortunately, it was only a one year initiative as well. So I've continued to stay in health emergency management and it's continued to be an issue as to where the provision of psychosocial services lie. I'm privy to, to see what some of the outcomes of that are um, and some of the disadvantages, a lot of the disadvantages are. Um, but I'm also the co-chair of something called Partners in Disaster in our province. So it's a half governmental, half non-governmental committee and a lot of the unmet needs end up coming to our committee. So we're able to address some of the one-offs that, that come through through emergency sorry, my or emergency measures organization. Um, so I, I keep my finger on the pulse that way, but I'm so glad to be a part of this panel and uh, so glad to see the research that's come out of this. So thank you. Thanks so much, everybody. And just a reminder to the participants, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat so we can get our panelists to respond. We can I can either ask them to all the panelists or if it, if there's a specific person you'd like to respond to your question, you can indicate that. Um, and maybe just to get us um, kind of started, I, I noted in my presentation the important role of relationships. And I'm curious if um, maybe each panelist can share an example of um, from your work and from your experience where relationships really supported community psychosocial recovery. Um, and maybe is there anyone who would like to start or I can kind of let you know. <laughs> Go for it. No, I just wanted to share. Um, I've been here since 2016 when the floods occurred in 2020 we already pre-existing relationship all of the agencies and partners and Alberta Health Services that were supporting recovery. So it's kind of easy, you know, the people you can call. But it was interesting um, to give you a, a situation. The, the flooding is Lower Town site, which is mainly made up of populations of older individuals. A lot of newcomers are there. And so when the, when the flooding evacuation ceased, you could see people walking around the lower town side like zombies, not knowing what to do. And so what I did is I created knowledge exchange. So I thought, what are all of the special populations that are impacted by the floods? And I invited the agencies that reflected those populations to a twice a week open room knowledge exchange. The reason why we did that, because if you create, it takes time to create form of just a way of accelerating um, exchange of information. So, um, and those had gone through the fires, so they are better prepared uh, to be able to support this the flood response. So, so for example, this amazing the two school districts. The first meeting they came red sheet of their families with the yellow families coded and the red families. So they already knew in advance to target the assistance. So, so the, the, the relationship and the relationships have continued and to the fact now uh, the participants really have expressed a desire to formalize that relationships post uh, event. Thank you. Thanks, Guy. Yeah, it's really interesting to hear that concrete example and I'm curious if um, yeah, it's something that other communities can adapt for their local context in a way that makes sense for them. So it's cool to hear about those examples. Um, would someone else like to share? Um, Margaret, Darlene, Graham? Sure, I, I can share. Um, well, for an example in um, Grand Forks and it actually was in the, their social impacts of the 2018 Grand Forks flood in one of the reports that talked about trust and what a key element that was with that locally uh, local led recovery and um, them trusting the, the, the people that were, you know, kind of in, in charge and trying to lead this. And I know also with myself um, representing kind of provincial um, help, I was, I was teamed up with a local um, lead who was seconded from the 
uh, largest NGO in, in the community and who knew the community very, very well. And uh, him and I, we just made up our minds very quickly that we were going to trust each other. But I also, when I met him and also went to their emergency operations center and met with some of the other um, leads and recovery manager, I went in to tell them exactly what I was there to help them to do and that I had no agenda other than to help them. And they said that meant a lot to them because even with you know some of the different NGOs that came in, they said they were coming in, but there was a price tag um, with coming with that. And also, you know, they felt that just about everybody had agenda. So that that was quite meaningful. And then also the fact that they hired um, their um, recovery uh, managers, whatever you want to uh, call them, liaison support to the impacted residents. Those roles they hired and trained from within the community. So they were very, very trusted um, people to you know, go in and have that conversation and asking very, um, uh, yeah, a heck of a lot of information from uh, the individuals impacted. So that was all um, hugely based on trust. So I hope that helps those examples. Thanks, Margareta. Yeah, just to yeah, build on what everyone on whatever. Oh, I'm getting all, oh, sorry. <laughs> to build on what everyone else is saying, um, uh, that's what we found too. As a provincial team, we work a lot with uh, local resources and other provincial organizations and groups, as well as local organizations and groups. And it's really important to make sure that um, we develop a network um, of of all of these groups that eventually develops trust. And right? it can a need can be then expressed, and support resources that can then be provided. If you try to skip those and just provide resources that you have available, it doesn't necessarily meet the need expressed by the local community. And then ultimately this also creates a more sustained community action that then can have ongoing supports going forward. And I can just add that in our experience, uh, we were provincially run, but we had four regional health authority teams. And at that time, because of the nature of how the flood occurred and where decisions were made in terms of water diversion, that was a provincial level decision. So we really utilized the regional health authorities, which you know came across a, a lot better than you know utilizing our provincial organization. There's a lot of trust within the regional health authorities. So we utilized them. Um, and then another thing that we really worked on was um, it, it wasn't necessarily helpful to have, you know, our posters and brochures and updates to websites to show that our teams existed and wanted to help sort of in the same way that Marguerite was saying, you know, we are there, you know, there's no strings attached, but I think there was a lot of distrust. So our teams ended up, you know, doing the door knocking and actually meeting people where they were and looking at their property and looking at their livestock and getting to know, know them as individuals. And it wasn't until then that any of our support groups or information sessions or anything like that um, started to be well attended. It was those personal relationships that we had to literally develop at their homes while they were busy attending to all the rest of their life as this flood was ongoing. Thanks so much for sharing. Thanks so much for sharing with her. Thanks. Um, yeah, what I'm noticing is that you, yeah, those relation that relationship piece is just so valuable and can't be skipped. And so I appreciate your examples. Um, I'll just ask a question that um, Angela has asked in the chat. Um, if each panelist can share some of your insights on disaster sequences, so situations in which one disaster follows another in quick succession, and you've already um, some of you have already talked about how that has happened. Um, I, she, Angela says, I imagine there may be some advantages like already being mobilized, but that approaches must also need to be shifted to deal with different needs of different disasters. Um, does anyone want to take that question on? I can try to say that recovery takes a long time. So if you have, for example, specifically with us in 2016, the wildfire, and then the flooding occurs in 2020, we still have fire impacted folks that are still in recovery. Now they're having to deal with um, flood recovery. In fact, those homes were not destroy destroyed and damaged twice, right? So that's just adds a great burden on those individuals. So 
Um, but at the same time, there's a level of capacity that's been built in the local organizations. And so they've been through a disaster. So now they have a bit of insight on what to do next. So that's kind of why it's easy to rally them around and have conversations and I guess accelerate the support. Mm -hmm. For some of our communities, I can just quickly add, um, we also had fires um, at the same time that we we're dealing with the flood recovery issues. So um, in some of those uh, cases, we kind of looked at where we could be the most effective because technically our funding was tied to the specific flood. Um, but so then we brought resources into RM offices, the same individuals who had been going through the flood for the whole last year. And now all of a sudden they're dealing with grassland fires and, you know, they're completely exhausted. So we're bringing them refreshments and, you know, trying to assist them in their EOCs just to relieve some pressure. And then we had our, um, some of our indigenous communities were evacuating from the north. And what we had found um, in prior evacuations when we didn't have any teams accessible to us is that there was a lack of activities for the children, a lack of uh, caregiving abilities for them while they're trying to fill out forms and figure out where they're going to be evacuated to. So, you know, we brought in TVs and movies and comfortable blankets and, you know, refreshments and those sorts of things. So, you know, it was a lot of small things that we tried to just add into some of those responses while we had the resources available. Um, you know, another reason why it would be great to have these teams ongoing. <laughs> so just to keep uh, the ball rolling, everything uh, that Guy and Darlene said uh, applied to us as well. I think the one thing uh, that we were able to do in order to deal with multiple incidents happening, multiple disasters occurring at once, um, is through our funding needed to be uh, generally specific, <laughs> so to speak. So trying to keep the, the funding options open, although our scope would still be disaster related, um, that it can then shift the focus a little bit more to deal with the more imminent issues that the community is dealing with. Yeah, a really good example of that funding challenge and navigating within the structures that exist to best support communities. Thanks, Graham. Uh, Margareta, is there something you would like to share? Uh, well, I guess, you know, I mean, it, it just adds so much complexity. And we, we had seen that, I mean, with the um, fires in Indigenous communities, you know, very, um, you know, predicting, yeah, well, then next comes the floods. And that was exactly um, what did happen. It's very difficult because then that just prolongs uh, the recovery and, and, you know, a lot of what Darlene said it as well, right? You're, you're trying to help with the most practical things that you can at the time because it just, um, yeah, it just goes on and on and on and the, the level of exhaustion for everyone. So the people that are being uh, evacuated, people that are um, isolated, can't get out of community, people can't get in. We did a lot of, not we, but the, the province, um, great work, incredible work with the uh, food bank and Salvation Army trying to get food into, food into isolated communities. Um, that, um, that basic, but you could just imagine that the, the psychosocial implications of that, it just uh, exacerbates um, everything. So, you know, as I said, all the more reason that, uh, you know, there's ongoing um, funding and, and resources because it's just going to prolong um, the recovery. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really good examples of how, you know, sometimes we consider the different uh, disaster management phases as um, kind of uh, this linear progress, but really showing that in real life, it's a lot more complicated than that. Um, I'd like to ask a question that Leah has posed in the chat, and she, um, they said, how do you ensure you are connecting with those most vulnerable during floods or other crises, and specifically the unhoused, um, people who are unhoused? Um, we found, I mean, this is as good as your um, working group is, and whether, I mean, we for a while or in, in different areas have called it like a mental health and wellness working group, but we also uh, know with provincially, uh, with emergency management, it's the uh, unmet needs committee. So however those people that get together, it's, a, it's as robust as who is part of your 
working groups. So in our toolkit, we try to, you know, give examples of all the different groups, but we, we have tried to always make sure that uh, we do include uh, exactly the, the people that you had, had mentioned. And some of that is outreach as well. And sometimes it's um, making, have, having NGOs at the table that really know their people, right? So this is all about um, community led. And, uh, you know, so for instance, in Grand Forks, I mean, you know, Darren knew every nook and cranny and who to, who to reach out to. And, and, you know, and we did, go through the province to come down and, and, you know, with some additional funding. So there could be more outreach, especially to the people that are unhoused and, and uh, some of the, you know, homeless encampments. And um, yeah. So, and, and we had, you know, we, we had the local food bank, we had the shelters, all of the, they were all part of that committee. So bringing everybody in from the start and having great it sounds like it requires a lot of coordination across different groups, like in addition to the relationships, but also that coordination so that people can navigate to what they need. Um, does anyone else want to comment on on connecting with some of um, some groups that might be more vulnerable or um, um, experiencing I'm experiencing ex yeah, I can just kind of quickly add, we work um, within the city of Winnipeg, there's a, a group called End Homelessness Winnipeg. Um, so they've created a lot of policies. This is different than a few years ago. They didn't have a lot of extreme weather policies. Um, and then we've also tried to kind of bridge um, their existence with some of the relationships that we have with um, entities like Environment and Climate Change Canada and get Environment and Climate Change Canada had to have more of a discussion about how some of these populations have a lower threshold uh, for, you know, quote unquote disaster. So um, for example, we've just had a, a cold notification because it's still, you know, in the minus twenties um, in Manitoba these days. And so, you know, even though that doesn't technically qualify as an extreme cold warning to go out to the province, it does in terms of our unsheltered um, population. So Environment Canada, they CC me on the email, but they send that to all of our shelters in the province. And so that they get that information directly. They're not waiting for anybody else to wait. They're not waiting for the generic warning to go out. They know that they're, um, you know, the people that they're taking care of need to have this information. And so do the organizations who are looking at protecting them. The only other thing that um, I'd like to just add is that um, a lot of the times that we've found, we haven't found a consistent way to get information about some of our other vulnerable populations, like home care clients, people living alone, uh, things like that. So we've actually relied a lot on um, <laughs> really diligent neighbors who end up calling. They know an organization and somehow, you know, if the organization is pretty far removed, it'll end up quickly filtering through and come to our partners in disaster organization because they've seen, um, you know, their neighbor and they're worried about them. And, uh, you know, it, it helps us find them a little bit faster. So some of it is very organic and grassroots. Oh, I love that. Oh, I love that. Marie. Marie. Oh. <laughs> Thanks, Darlene. Um, Murray, yeah, we, Murray, we actually secured funding. So what we did was actually targeted the agencies that support special populations. So for example, the Center of Hope are the is agency that supports the homeless. So they're the ones that are gonna know the most of how to find and how to support those individuals. But we also had uh, the Multicultural Association as one of our partners. So we have, high newcomer uh, population. There were a lot of directives around water advisories that needed to be translated. So I look at things, I look at things, partners as vertical structures and horizontal structures. So vertical structures, they specifically deal with the population like the homeless or adults. Horizontal structures are like the multicultural association or for example, SOA touch all of the populations. And so when you do that, it allows a better integration across all of all of the groups that are experiencing the events. Thanks, Guy. And Graham, I can give you a chance if there's something you wanna to add to what the other people have shared. I think that everybody kind of summed it up really well. I mean, what we've found is, um, 
it's all about the local representation, which has been discussed. So if you build local community capacity, uh, which is the goal of our team, so try to train local facilitators to have that voice and to let you know where the needs are within the community and which vulnerable population needs to be addressed. And then you're providing resources and supports to community members who then provide it to their neighbors. So it's by the community for the community and you'll have better buy-in and support. And that, again, comes back to the sustainability that I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Graham. Um, there's one question in the chat that says, how do you deal with the unknown? Which I feel like there's a lot of room for interpretation within that question. So, um, any thoughts on on that? I'm sure there's a lot of kind of moving parts and every create a knowledge exchange. <laughs> create a not seriously create a knowledge exchange, because what you, if you don't know you don't know how are you going to find out? So I found that to be a root of uh, mechanism because it was like you just participated. You didn't sign up. You know you didn't have to do any formalities, and we helped us navigate and find out. So. As an example, uh, we have a number of um, ET who are part of the elder population in the town site. And we found with the COVID activities that had started, those activities all blended together. So by talking, lo talking locally, this way to find out what's going on. I would, and I really appreciated the learning that I had during that knowledge exchange. And in fact, I've actually used the knowledge exchange in another sort of because I find it's a re really effective way of building trust because you're sharing. <laughs> and then once you build trust, then you can start looking at coordinating and co I completely I, I agree completely. And um, yeah, we need to do more of this stuff, more knowledge sharing and all this stuff. It's, it's very, very difficult. So um, thanks for this. Stuff. And I think it was you, Guy, during when during our project that you talked about just attending a lot of meetings and getting to know the key players and asking lots of questions. So kind of finding out what you don't know yet. It's a good point. Um, would someone else like to add something? I just have something to add really quick. I think it's important to add uh, an amount of being dynamic into your response. So being flexible flexible in what you're doing and how you're doing is to be able to listen to that voice to be able to instigate change. So again, it comes back to funding that requires specific deliverables, leaving those deliverables as wide as you can so that you are able to move your path as you're responding. Yeah, great point around just being agile and flexible. Agile and flexible. And I was just going to say too, I think um, we've talked talked a little bit about um, like trust building, but I think, you know, if you're at those meetings and you're hearing different concerns, if you're saying that you're going to take those concerns and actually, you know, liaise with some of the organizations that you have partnerships and bring that information back and then show that you are actually doing things and prove yourself in that way, because, you know, they have a lot of interface with government and organizational, um, you know, wants, but it doesn't ne necessarily translate into getting things done. So the more a community can see you actually doing things, um, you know, it just, it, it builds a better rapport and then those relationships flow and they seem to, you know, be asking you for things and giving you more information and then you can tailor things to better suit their needs. So I'm oh, just going to quickly you. jump in. <laughs> oh, sorry, Maxie. No, I just was saying I see you popped on and I noticed the time. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say I mean, we've had a great discussion and you know we're almost at the end. Um, Maxine, did you want to quickly um, wrap up with just saying what the next steps are for this project and what people can expect? Um, yeah, maybe I'll just note that we'll be um, taking some of the resources that were shared in the chat and um, the kind of like last call, maybe if there's something you'd like to share, then go for, the, for it now and um, just summarizing in a blog post. And so that'll be posted online and um, yeah, just encourage, I guess, everybody to check out the reports that have a lot more details and, and really thank um, the panelists who are also advisors and key informants on, on the project.